We are dropping water. Yeah. Why are we dropping water? There's no way around that. Okay. Um, are we let's see if live? We actually went live. Hello. We're live. Are we? Hey! Oh no, that was you just chatting earlier. <laughs> <laughs> like what? Mm. How do I get this thing out of here? Now. What? <laughs> Okay. So we live? No? Maybe? Yeah, it says we're live. Hi. Hi, everyone. I think maybe we're live? Yes, you are. How come I can't see it? Oh, there it is. Yay. Okay, that was very difficult. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, okay. It seems like it's going really slow when is, I'm watching yeah, it here. It is going to be slow. It's oh. Dropping yeah. frames. oh, okay. So, um, apparently it's dropping lots of frames and there's all these technical things, but um, I'm really sorry that we are late. Uh, for some reason, Zoom decided that it did not want to cast to, um, to Twitch and we'll have to do something about that. We have not had that problem before, but um, now we have, so we'll try and figure it out. But um, we know whether but we're here now. Yeah, we're here now. Yay! Um, Yay! Okay, cool. But then I have no idea whether we have any people watching or anything. That's on here. You still need oh, the chat on it. Okay. All right. But will I see anything here? We'll still see chat. But I don't see how if we have people or not. Okay. All right. Well, I have no idea if anyone's watching us or not. But you can chat at me, so I'll know you hear you're here. Um, so if you're here and watching, please say hi in the chat so that I'll know. And um, if not, we're just going to do this and we're going to record it so that we have something to use um, in the future when people ask me, what is this magic game? How do I play this? I'm going to say, oh, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch us. Um, but anyway, today I am here. I am Kathleen. I own Labyrinth Games and Puzzles, and I'm here with two members of our magic team, Tim Tan and Alex Palmer. Yay. Hey guys. It's nice to see Hello. you. Hello. Um, it's nice to see you too. <laughs> okay. So I believe that Tim was going to try and share his screen and we're going to go through. We have a PowerPoint presentation for all of you, which is lots we of We do. Fun. Then we're going to, yeah. um, Alex and I are going to play a game of magic with Tim helping me beat Alex somehow, maybe, with a Planeswalker deck. And, I think uh, you'll be okay. We're going to chat a little bit about Zendikar Rising, uh, the new set, which is, the pre-release is next weekend. We're holding a couple of virtual mm -hmm. releases, and, um, and then we, the release is the following Friday. What day is the release? Do you all remember the date? It's like September. Uh, the 23rd, 22nd, the something like that. Uh, the 25th. So 25th. Um, the, the new set, for anyone who does not know anything about Magic at all, kind of like me a long time ago, um, Magic the Gathering is a collectible card game. Um, and every, about every quarter, although lately it feels like a lot more, um, every quarter they come out with a new set, uh, in the, in the game with new cards and a new theme sometimes and new mechanics sometimes. And, um, so that's happening, um, Pre-release is kind of when they let us sell some cards before the official release. And, uh, yeah, that's happening next weekend with a new set called Zendikar Rising. But um, So let's talk mm -hmm. first about how to play a little bit and what magic is. So I'm going to let sure. All right. Alex and Tim do this portion. Your video is frozen. You can, you can still hear you. Sounds good. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, let's get this up on. Hopefully, that works. Did that work? Hey, there we there go. We go. All right. So, this is a beautiful uh, yes. slideshow that Alex made. Learn to play magic with Labyrinth Games and Puzzles. Right. Welcome, everybody, to my beautiful on, PowerPoint presentation. Our, hold on, hold on, hold on, guys. They can't see our slideshow okay. yet because my thing froze. 
Okay. okay. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> Do you think that there's a problem because of my computer? Um, it's doing the best it can. <laughs> my poor computer. Game of dice. The little hard drive that could. Yeah. I was told there would be magic tricks. Well, you want to see a magic trick? How about I make this pencil disappear? <laughs> I could I could do some like card magic, but I don't know how how good it'll be with like a magic deck. Is this your card? Well, there are four more, so it might be. <laughs> you have a math. <laughs> Twenty percent chance of joining the exact same card. Yeah, I know. I'm working on. Well, in the meantime, look at this this beautiful Zendikari Vista. <laughs> Who has Zendikari? Uh, I have mine. Is what is mine? Mine's Ikoria background, right? Yeah. Yours is Ikoria. Tim's is Ugin from Corset 2021, and mine is the same one that is the front. Uh, page of the PowerPoint. So the, the Zendikar Rising key art. We got, uh, directions are hard. We got a little, we got a, we got a plated geopede right there. We got, we got some flying hedrons up here and here. Here. Yeah, the magic trick will, will be getting all the tech to work properly together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you, the the trick is making that um, that Turing machine deck work. Oh God, I watched it in uh, at work, like complete a whole cycle, and I think I might fall asleep if someone tried to play it against me. <laughs> and it would take a very very long time with a lot of a huge table to yeah. do a little thing. You would have to draw the plan from the get go. Yep. And then it locks you out of the game. Only yep. the guy with the machine can play. Yep. It doesn't do anything. It just, it just does the machine. But yeah. you know, your opponent's not doing anything first. Yeah. Well, that's okay. I'm very excited to teach magic. I haven't taught anyone how to play in like a long time. A year, probably. No, nah, it hasn't been that long. It hasn't been but... a year. <laughs> it, it feels like it sometimes. I mean, <laughs> probably like February. I'm... February yeah. was the last time I, I taught someone in person how to play magic. Probably. Yeah. What if we do this? What if we just do like a spell table? Okay. Yeah. Well, then they can't see our. Yeah, that's okay. So we, you skip the presentation. We're not going to have a talk. presentation. We're going to talk oh. about. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, we'll save the PowerPoint for some other time. Yep. That's a good PowerPoint. I like that PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. So they can't see your talking heads. No, my head. It's still here. It's still <laughs> attached. Did I put it on this morning? Now we just need to know what. Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, hey. Um, hello. Hello. Is anybody out there? Um, All right. Uh, okay. Y'all can so... turn off your video. If everybody stops video in um in Zoom, that'll help a little. Okay. Will they hear us? Hear so they're hearing too. us from Zoom, and, and they're, they're seeing, seeing spell, spell table. table. Yeah. So. Which means I have to open spell table now. Mm -hmm. I've got it open. Okay. Uh, my hand is my hand visible? Yes. Great. Uh, and this is working now. They can see spell table. Okay, can... so people can now see spell table. So we're gonna have to throw away or at least postpone. The the... Yeah, we're gonna postpone our beautiful PowerPoint that um, that we made. But um, Alex and Tim are going to talk through it, and I am going to show you cards. Okay. Um, so so we... before we get into the decks, let's let's go over like the very broad strokes of what magic is before we you know start telling people what card types are and things like that. Yeah. So 
Magic the Gathering is a, as you said, collectible card game. Um, it's lots of different formats. There's lots of different ways to play. But overall, you are a planeswalker. You are a powerful wizard um, who travels between the different worlds of the multiverse. And you call upon creatures and spells from those worlds and you manifest them in a battle against your other planeswalker opponents and your library represents your collective knowledge of spells and creatures that you are pulling from beyond the aether to do battle for you um you the generally you win or you, your goal is to reduce your opponent's life total from 20 to zero and there are many, many ways to do that. Um, but the most common way is to play creatures and uh, spells that reduce your opponent's life points. Um, so you're going to be attacking, you're going to be dealing damage with spells, um, and you're going to be disrupting what your opponents are doing um, through removal or counter spells or many different things there's a there's a lot of different ways to play the game and uh the colors of magic um which we'll get into in a minute um sort of define what kind of strategy you'll be using depending on what colors you pick so um tim what tell me what are the colors of magic if tim can hear me I don't know. I can can't he? hear Tim anymore again. Oh, no. Yeah, this oh, helps if I unmute myself. Oh. <laughs> um, so the colors of magic include, in no particular order, white, sure. blue, black, red, and green. Black, sure. Um, black, red, green. Yep. Yeah. So Kathleen's deck is probably going to only have white cards in it, but let's go over what each color generally does um, and what its preferred play style is. Yeah. So white is the color of like law, order, and structure. Mm -hmm. Like it's all about creating um, an army of a large, humongous army of little creatures, and then using spells to make them stronger. Mm -hmm. White's the like you said, the color of unity and and working together. Yeah. Um, so white wins because it's you know, more cohesive than you. The white makes a lot of like small tokens and you know strong units um, yeah. to do that. Yeah, and your like your creature comes into play and buffs another creature, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. White also has a slight um, sub theme of being the police. Mm -hmm. um, so white likes to um, exile things. We'll get white to what like, exile means. Like, right. Well, white, white likes game. to set the rules. Yeah. Um, saying, you know, there, there are cards in white that say you can only play one spell per turn. Yeah. Or you can only cast certain kinds of spells. Things all, like that. All your creatures, no matter how big they were, are now just one ones. Right. They're right. tiny. They're now, everything on the board is now tiny. Right. Yeah. So white's the color of not only... Uh, togetherness and unity, but also of law and order and peacemaking and things like that. Yep. That doesn't sound like the color for me at all. Maybe I should take this deck back. <laughs> well, you've already got it out. <laughs> I know. I'm just kidding. Okay. It just definitely uh, doesn't sound like my play style. Well, that's huh? why there are lots of different colors and lots of different decks out there. So everyone can try... Uh, the different colors and see what they like, what they don't like. Um, and the only way to know is to play and to try it out. Yep. Okay, so uh, what about blue? Blue is what Tim normally plays, right? Uh, yeah, I like to play blue and black. So blue is the color of trickery and manipulation and proving that you are the smartest person in the room. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about controlling the battlefield and controlling what your opponent is can do. So right. it goes very well to, with white sometimes because white also likes to kind of control what your opponent does. But blue is more like uh, you don't even get to do that is the color, basically. Yeah, blue, blue is the color of saying no. Yeah. Like, I don't want you to do that. You don't get to do that at all. Right. 
Um, blue wins, like you said, because it's smarter than you. Blue is the color of strategic planning, um, yeah. of thinking ahead, uh, also of uh, of ma of magic and of card draw and of artifice. Um, so of it's also the color of like higher learning and um, using your arcane knowledge to get ahead. Yeah. I and think then... it's important to note, though, if anybody who is actually watching this is brand new, all of this is not enormously important when you first start. Um, yeah. Knowing kind of a very general sense that there's five colors, and let's not go into super... I think we should not go into super, super nitty-gritty details, because I think for a new player, that would completely overwhelm me. Okay. Um, um, but yeah. All right, so let's so let's let's white quickly is go. More purity and structure and law and order. Um, blue is more trickery and stuff. What about black? Black is kind of more like vampires and scary stuff, right? right? So black has the black zombie card. I open one of my booster packs. Uh, so black is often the color of death and destruction, um, but it's also the color of ambition and power. Um, black wants to win at any cost. You'll 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 throw away your life total. You'll throw away your creatures. You'll throw away the cards in your hand, um, all for the reward of gaining power over your opponents and getting to do things that the other colors don't normally get to do. Um, black can do most things in Magic, um, but usually at the cost of life or some other kind of resource. So if you're all about trying to win uh, at, at any cost, then black is probably the color for you. Okay, and then what about red? I found a red card in my booster pack. It's a Flummox Cyclops. And, so, uh, so yeah, red. Yeah, red is the color of passion, of uh, ferocity, of fire and lightning. Um, red wins often because it's faster than you. Um, red has lots of small creatures um, that aren't necessarily uh, unified in the same way that white is, um, but often are just all about trying to deal as much damage as quickly as possible. So if you want to play a very fast game uh, and, and try to overwhelm your opponents quickly, red might be the color for you. Okay. I like red. Red is my favorite color. Um, Red's good. And I also like green. Yeah, green. Green. Uh, There's a green one card. Yeah, so finally green. Green is the color of nature and of connection to the land. Um, green is also the color of large creatures. Um, you're using your mastery of the natural world to summon forth uh, behemoths and hydras and uh, giant dinosaurs or lizards or things like that. Um, so not only are you getting more lands out onto the battlefield than other players, you're also using them more effectively to cast larger spells quickly. Okay. So that's kind of the colors. Um, mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. for newer players, the important thing to remember is that sometimes you can get a Planeswalker deck and it'll just be a solo color. Like my deck today is going to be all white. But mm -hmm. most decks are a mixture of colors. Um, yep. Can y'all talk a little bit about like, let's talk about first what the different, like, so most people play standard magic or mm -hmm. commander. Um, mm -hmm. standard is usually a two play, a two, like one on one, two player game, uh, one V one commander is a version of magic. That's different. That is a multiplayer format, but most people learn to play by playing standard. Um, mm -hmm. I think that like most people decks come either in planeswalker decks or um, right now there's an arena starter kit that's really good to start with that has kind of two uh, single decks in it that have a lot of the rules and things. Um, and then you'll also see when you go to a store, you'll see things that look like this, oops, which are booster packs. These are random cards. So once you get to know how to play, the whole idea is that then you would buy random cards have a collection of cards that's why they call it a collectible card game and then you would take those cards and build your own deck and alex and tim i mean what y'all find really fun with this game is building the decks right 
Yeah, I definitely get most of my enjoyment of magic out of taking the cards that I've accrued over a, a long period of time and making interesting or, or new brews of cards that you know come out. And it's fun seeing how the new cards interact with the old cards in ways that you know they probably never predicted. But because they all exist in the same system, you can do lots of really, really cool interactions with them. Yep. So, and a lot of people will also um, ask, what's the difference in older cards and newer cards? And what, do you, what can you play with? What's your standard answer when we have people ask that? Uh, so, well, yeah, go ahead, Tim. Go ahead. Okay. So, generally, um, the difference only matters if you're playing a, um, an official format or if you're playing like an official event. Um, in that case, you have to care about when your cards were printed, what set they're from, because there are many different formats that have... Um, you can only play cards that were printed from this date to this date in order to try to exert some control over how powerful these decks can become. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you're playing at home, you can kind of pretty much play... With any yeah. cards you have, if you, if your dad or if your, you know, brother or something has a whole old box of cards in the, in the closet or something, some of them you have to be careful because some old cards are very, very valuable. So you probably want to yeah. figure out whether your cards are valuable before you take them out and give them to your like eight year olds. But, right. um, but yeah, so, but basically if you're playing at home and playing for fun, you can play with any cards throughout the history. Right yeah. now, we do have Planeswalker decks. We have the Arena Kits, which will give you pre-built decks. Um, I usually find that it's good to play with pre-built decks and try decks of different colors um, before you start building your own decks. And usually, when a new set comes out, there are um, things like bundles that have a lot of booster packs in them with land cards, too. And then there are also things um, every once in a while you can find called a deck builder's toolkit, which will come with a bunch of cards and some booster packs and some land that will help you start um, kind of deck building. But today we're going to talk about a pre-made deck. Um, mm -hmm. You have a pauper deck, right? That's correct. So your deck is uh, a pre-built and would be a standard legal deck. Right. This deck that I'm playing is for a format called Pauper. Um, it uses the same number of cards in the deck, so it's still 60 cards. Um, the difference being that these cards are from throughout the history of Magic the Gathering, but they're all common rarity. So there are no uncommons, no rares, no mythic rares, none of that. All commons, um, which is uh, another difference to yours. Yours is going to have... Uh, uncommons and rares and a, a mythic rare planeswalker um, oh, as part of the, the pre-built rarities of cards that's a good yep. thing to tell people um as we talked about this is a collectible card game one of the things that makes it collectible is that there are different rarities of cards um do y'all want to explain what the different rarities are yeah so the card you're holding up is a common um, we can tell because of the set symbol. And the set symbol is to the right of the type line. Um, it's always in the same place on each card um, that's printed nowadays anyway. Um, and usually the uh, common rarity will either be in black or white. Um, and it should be pretty obvious. Um, so this one's in black, as you can see. Um, the uncommons will have the same... Down here on the bottom. Oops, I don't know if I can show it because I yep. don't know if the camera will... It also shows on it'll newer cards. It'll show you at the bottom for C for common, um, U for uncommon, R for rare, and then M for mythic. Um, but the colors on the set expansion symbol will also tell you. So commons are always black or white. Um, uncommons are a kind of like silvery gray color on the expansion symbol. Um, and then rares have a kind of a, a brassy gold uh, look to them. And then mythics have a, a kind of fiery burnt orange kind of look. Yeah, this um, is, so uh, that one, Eat to Extinction, is a, a rare. That one's a rare. I don't have a mythic on me right now. That's okay. Um, so another way to tell if it's a rare or mythic is that all new printed uh, cards that are rare or mythic will have that little foil hollow at the very bottom of the card. Um, and that's put on each 
oh, magic yeah. card, not only to denote that it's a rare, but also to prevent counterfeiting. Oh, I got like King Kong. Um, King your Kong? Planeswalker should be Mythic Rare. Yes, the Planeswalker in your deck should be Mythic oh, okay. Rare, but if I you shuffled it in, it. don't worry about it. I can find it and show people. Sure. Um, hmm. That made me think of something, and I was going to go into it, and it was a, it was about rarity. Eh, I'm sure I'm sure I'll think of it. Uh, so yeah, those are the the four different rarities at this point. We you know who knows if they're going to add another rarity, but I don't think they will. There um, There's the color of mythic. Oops, it's hard to see. Hold on. Yeah, because it's a, it's hard to so show with a, a foil on the camera. Yeah, there it is. It's there like you go. almost orangey. Mm -hmm. It's like a red orange for Mythic. Um, you will definitely tell uh, Rare is definitely much more gold-like than a Mythic. Yes. Mythic yeah, the, 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 the Mythic is definitely uh, an orange color, and the Rares are definitely a, uh, a bronzy gold. There. I don't know if you can see the difference. Uh, it's hard to see the difference, but yeah, it's... Um, Rare is much more yellow, and Mythic is more red. Mythics yep. are very, very hard to get, generally. I mean, they're not mm -hmm. super common. The rarity, I think, is like one in one in four, or maybe one in six packs nowadays have a, a Mythic in them. Um, but every booster pack that you open of Magic cards will always have one rare in it. Um, it the rare in some packs might be replaced by a Mythic, but in all booster packs of Magic, you'll always find um, a bunch of commons, three uncommons, and then a rare or mythic. And sometimes a foil behind the rare or mythic. And if you're lucky, it could be a foil rare or mythic. That would be very exciting. It would be very exciting. Um, okay, so what about... Um, oh, we should probably talk about at least a small thing of what are the different um, types of cards. Obviously the most important type um, to understand what it is is a mana or land card, which this is yep. a white one. Yep. Um, so, yeah, go ahead, Tim. Talk okay, about this. So, I like to separate the cards when I explain this um, into two, two different categories. Um, permanents and non-permanents. So if you will find a land, a creature, an enchantment, I don't think that deck has artifacts in it. Yeah. And then yeah. your planeswalker. De definitely at least lands, creatures, and planeswalkers. Yeah. I have and an then, instant. Yeah, I should have enchantments because it's a... Yeah, it's a, a, a Sarah spec. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So tell me land, why, the, why land is important. So lands are how you are going to play your game, how you're going to cast your spells, how you're going to summon your creatures. So every single turn, um, you get to add one more to your side of the playing field. And every turn, you get to tap it, which is symbolized by the, um, you turn it 90 degrees to the, yeah, you turn it 90 degrees, indicating you've used that land this turn. Mm -hmm. And each land will generate in general one mana of that type yep to pay the cost of the spells um don't worry the lands untap themselves at the start of every turn so you get to use them again but you can only use them once a turn to pay for your spells mm -hmm. and you can uh, you can cast multiple spells you know using up to the number of lands that you have to produce that much mana yeah as long as you can pay for your spells with the lands you currently have untapped you can cast as many as you want Yep. The next thing we're going to look at is creatures, uh, which is your primary method of dealing damage. Um, so the anatomy of the creature card is very important here. Um, if you look to the top left, that's the name of the creature. Pretty self-explanatory. The top right is your casting cost. Now, when I talked about lands, I talked about paying for the casting cost. To read this casting cost, you're going to look at the number in the gray circle, and then any additional additional uh, symbols in other circles. And the way you read it is the number in the gray circle symbolizes the number of 
mana of any color, you have to have the card that spell. And then additional symbols represent one mana of that particular color. So, for example, the uh, Elspeth's... Um, I can't really read this. Let Elspeth's me pull up. Devotee. Yeah, Elspeth Devotee. Um, you see two and two white symbols. For a total of four mana, you need to cast the spell. The breakdown is you need two of any color. Doesn't have to be white. Any color you want. And two white, very specifically, yep. to cast the spell. Has to be at least two white. It could be, it could be you know three white and a blue. Yeah. But it has to be at least two white. Yeah. And then down here. And yeah, and then you go through uh, the middle bar. Is it shows it's a creature, and then it has creature types that doesn't matter unless um, a card says you need to worry about it. Um, so the card will say if you need to worry about it. Yep. Um, and then below that is. Um, normally it would be flavor text, which is in italics, uh, right below, right at mm -hmm. the bottom. But this card in particular has a special effect when it enters the battlefield. So this is your rules and flavor text box. Um, the rules text will always be on the top, non italicized. Yeah. And then the flavor text, which is just, you know, expanding upon the card in the world will be under it in italics. Yeah. So you read the rules text. When Elspeth Devotee enters the battlefield, you may search your library and or graveyard for a card named Elspeth Undaunted Hero, reveal it, and put it into your hand. If you search your library this way, shuffle it. So basically, do what it says on the card. Mm -hmm. um, when it enters the battlefield, do all these things in this particular order. Yep. Yep. And then at the very bottom of the card, you get to its power and its toughness. So the power is the first number um, that denotes how much damage it deals when it attacks um, an opposing player. If it doesn't get blocked, it will deal the first number's amount of damage to their life total. And so you'll remove that many life points. Um, it also, uh, if, if it does get blocked, it will deal that same amount of damage to the creature that it's blocking. Yeah. And that uh, goes to the second number. The second number is its toughness. Um, that's how much damage that creature can take before it dies. And when creatures die, they go to the graveyard. Um, and there's lots of different ways to uh, mess around with different powers and toughnesses and things like that. Um, but mostly you, you care about how much damage can this deal and how much damage can this take before it goes away. Yep. And then after creatures, um, enchantments particularly important for Theros. Mm -hmm. um, so enchantments are another permanent. Um, so, sorry, before I go any further, I should explain permanents. Uh, what you cards you play that stay in play. Mm -hmm. Non-permanents don't stay in play. So permanents hit the battlefield and they stick there. Right, and they might have a they might have a, a effect that happens when they enter the battlefield, or they might have a, a continuous effect, something yeah. that uh, keeps happening. Yeah. So enchantments, in particular, remain on the battlefield and provide a continuous effect. Mm -hmm. um, Unless somebody does something to get rid of them. In yeah. For instance. Um, and then, sorry, the last permanent is your planeswalker. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. So Planeswalkers are a relatively new addition to Magic the Gathering. Uh, what it does is uh, it symbolizes you summoning someone else to fight at your side. So in Magic, um, Alex has said that uh, players take the role of Planeswalkers themselves. Mm -hmm. And this symbolizes you summoning another Planeswalker to come and help you in the battle. It's like, hi, friend. Come on down. Yep. And in order to help you, what they do is they come into the battlefield with a specific number of loyalty counters. So they are only loyal to you until their loyalty runs out. And that number is on the bottom right. So Elspeth in particular will come down Oops. with five loyalty counters on her. Okay. And it's hard to show her because she's so shiny. Yeah. <laughs> um, so she comes out with five loyalty counters. Uh, every turn, you get to activate one of her abilities, mm -hmm. and, and only abilities. one. And you have to pick from the list. And on the list, you will see there is a plus two, a minus two, and a minus eight. 
right? Yeah. So the first ability, a plus two, adds loyalty. So, so you, you add the loyalty and then you do the ability. Yeah. So your loyalty goes up from five to seven and then you do what it says on the card and that particular um, choice. You get to put a plus one, plus one counter on something. Yeah. And then minus two, you have to subtract two loyalty from the loyalty that she has. Uh, the number of loyalty counters she has on her, you have to take two away in order to perform that effect, which is to search your library and or graveyard for a card named Sunlit Hoplite and put it onto a battlefield. Um, and then finally, what we call the Planeswalker Ultimate is the ability on the very bottom of the card. It's a minus eight. So the thing to note here is that you cannot ultimate a Planeswalker in general the turn you play it because they will never ever come in with enough loyalty to just ultimate straight away. Mm -hmm. You have to build up that loyalty by doing the plus two over a few turns and then you are only allowed to subtract loyalty counters if you have equal or more to that number already on the Planeswalker. Right. Uh, you yeah. don't... You yeah, you you can't spend loyalty you don't have. Yeah, and the uh, if you use you can use all of the ability all of the loyalty to do an ability. So if you if she has exactly eight loyalty, you can use all of that. But then because you're using the minus eight ability, she'll have zero loyalty and therefore leave the battlefield to the graveyard. But the effect still happens. Yeah. Okay, and then now we move on to the non permanents. Yeah. So non-permanents are basically instants and sorceries. Those are the only two types of non-permanents. Mm -hmm. um, and basically what they represent is a spell you yourself as a planeswalker are casting. Um, so you pay the mana cost, and then you do what it says on the card, but the card doesn't stick to the battlefield. It goes straight to your graveyard. Mm -hmm. It'll say instant. And it will say instant or enchantment on it, or um, instant or sorcery on it, right? Yeah, right. So the sorceries card. are like um, are similar to creatures in that you can only play them on your turn. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, but instants, as the name might imply, can happen anytime. You can cast them on your opponent's turns or on your turn. You can be flexible with them, which is why instants are quite powerful. That's what I'm so bad at. I'm so bad at knowing when to play things. That's like my worst thing. <laughs> That's definitely a, a skill you hone over time. Yeah. Um, through lots of games is uh, sequencing and when to play cards and things like that. Yeah. It's also why blue tends to be the hardest card to play because right. a lot of blue is instants. Yep. Okay, so why don't we start playing and explain like what we're doing in the turn um, as we get into it. What do y'all think? Because I think it'll be yeah. more fun if people are actually watching it. Um, so sure, sounds, sounds kind, good to me. Here's kind of a basic rundown of um, this comes in a Planeswalker deck. Uh, it's hard to see. It's not focusing exactly. But anyway, on your turn, you're going to... Um, and we'll go through what all the phases are as we do it. What do you think? Yeah, sounds great. Okay. So the first thing that you do is once you find an opponent to play with and you have your, you know, your deck constructed and everything like that, is you're going to draw a hand of cards. Um, you start with seven cards in hand. Um, so you, you take seven off the top of your shuffled library. And once you have your seven, you pick them up and then you look at them. And do you think... Your hmm. deck is called a library. Yes, your deck is called a library. Your library of spells and lands and such. Um, so your you look at your hand. Your pile is called your graveyard. Um, so you look at your hand. And ideally, you want a mix of lands and spells because you need lands to cast your spells. Um, and you want to be able to play, ideally, one land per turn so you can play more expensive spells. Um, and a spell is everything that isn't a land. Um, even permanents and non-permanents alike are all spells. Um, so when you hear someone say you need a mix of lands and spells, you want lands and then something to do with your lands. And that can be many different things depending on the deck that you're playing. 
Um, if you look at your hand and it doesn't have any lands, or if you look at your hand and it doesn't have any spells, then a good thing might be to do what is called a mulligan. And what a mulligan is, is you take your hand and you shuffle it back into your library and you shuffle really well, and then you draw a new hand. Um, and if you're in a one versus one match, if you decide you like your second hand, you will take one of the cards and you'll put it on the bottom of your library. So you'll start the game with six instead of seven. Um, and if you still don't like your second hand, you can continue and go to a third hand, in which case you will only keep five of those cards. Um, but hopefully you're shuffling well enough that your second or third time around, you'll get a hand you're happy with. I'm taking a free mulligan. Sure. I'm not going to go down to six cards. That's okay. For for casual that. or multiplayer games um, like this is, uh, you know, obviously talk with your opponents, but most people will probably be fine with you taking a free mulligan because nobody wants to play against a deck that's not doing anything. Magic is a game of interaction, so you want to make sure that your opponent is do so doing something, and so are you. Yeah, I think that's really different than most other non-collectible card games. Like, it seems <clears throat> like, I don't know how many other card games, like, you can look at your first hand and then decide, no, I don't really like this. Right. <clears throat> um, and it the, the mulligan system helps with... Um, any deck building snafus you might have run into um, because you get to, you get a couple chances to look at your deck and to, to pull a hand of seven and to think about, like okay, well, if I like this hand. Okay. I'm happy with my hand. Um, would you like to go first? Um, I can. Okay. okay. Um, you know, normally sometimes you can, you can randomly decide who goes First, if you're feeling altruistic, you can let your opponent no, go first. I think we should roll dice. Okay. What kind of die would you like to roll? I was going to roll two d6s. Uh, I can do that. I have two d6s as well. I got seven. I got three. Oh, so I am going first no matter what. You are going first. Okay. So okay. on my first turn, I'm not going to show uh, Tim my cards yet. Later on, I'll have to show Tim my cards. I'm going okay. to just play a white uh, plains land. It's important to know, I guess, if you're uh, a new player, all of the lands have names like plains and swamp and um, things like that. But you can also just call them by the color that they are. Um, so this is a white mana. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's hard to see on here, but there you go. And then I am going to pass my turn because I do not have anything that only costs one mana. Yep, I okay. think this might be a good time to go through the uh, phases of the turn. Of, ah, yes. Yeah. Um, I can do that with my turn. That's fine. Sure. Um, okay, so because of, I'm not the starting player, um, I get to draw because it is my first turn and I didn't go first. So the parts of a turn are you untap any lands that you have or creatures you have that are tapped. Um, you go to your upkeep if there are any cards uh, on the battlefield like permanents that care about uh, an upkeep phase this is when you would do it and then after you untap and upkeep you get to draw one card from your library and put it into your hand um, then you go to what is known as the first main phase the main phase is when you can cast creatures and sorceries any spell really um, but play your lands in play your lands, you can play one land per turn, um, but you can do that on either main phase. So you have two main phases in a turn, both of which are sandwiching your combat phase, in which you will declare attackers and blockers and things like that. But let's let's go through our, our turn really slowly. Um, so on my first main phase, I will play an island, and then I will tap that island for one blue mana, and I will play an artifact, a, a type of card we didn't talk about in Kathleen's deck. But an artifact is another type of permanent. Um, and this artifact is called Field Mist Border Post. And Field Mist Border Post says, I may pay one generic mana and return a basic land I control to my hand rather than pay its mana cost. Field Mist Border Post enters the battlefield tapped, and I can tap it for blue or white mana. So I will 
pay the one mana from my island and return this island to my hand to play this field mist border post, which will end with the battlefield tapped. Um, I don't have anything to else to do on my first main phase, and I don't have any creatures, so I cannot go to combat. My second main phase happens, but I don't have any lands to play, and I don't have any mana to use, so I can't do anything on my second main phase. I will pass to the end of my turn, and I will pass to Kathleen's turn. Okay. Mm. So it's untap, upkeep, draw. Yep. So I did not yep. tap anything last time, yep. so I don't have anything to untap, so I get to draw a card. <laughs> And now I get to play another land. And I do have things that will cost two. Um, so now I need to decide what I'm going to play first. Let's see. Okay. So, Alex, close your eyes. Okay. <laughs> I have my arm in front of my face. Okay. Uh, that is what I have. Okay, I am looking this up on... On Spell Table? Yeah. I think I'm going to play... Play the one you have two of. Yes, that's what I'm going to play. Cool. Um, this is Sunlit Hoplite. So he costs two mana, and one of them has to be white, but I have two white, so I'm going to tap those. And then he is a human soldier, um, and as long as it's my turn, Sunlit Hoplite has first strike. What does first strike mean? Okay, so first strike is a special modifier that applies in combat. Um, so what it means is that Let's go over the combat phases uh, to make more sense of this. Uh, let me pull this up. Okay, so in combat, if you notice on your turn phase list, there is uh, declare attackers, declare blockers, and then the damage phase. So combat is split up into three different sub phases. So the active player, the person whose turn it is, declares attackers saying these creatures are going to go straight for your face and then you tap those creatures to symbolize that they are they have been used to attack mm -hmm. um, and then the defending player which is the one whose turn it isn't declares that if they have any untapped creatures they get to throw these creatures in front of the um, attacking creatures to try to stave off some of the damage. So instead of the attacking creature hitting them in the face, they can say, your attacking creature hits this creature instead, one of my creatures instead. All right? Yep. First strike comes into play when the block happens most of the time. Um, so what it is is that when damage is being dealt, if a creature has first strike, it will deal its damage first to the other creature before anything else happens. This is important because um, damage usually happens at the exact same time, so creatures punch each other at the exact same moment in time, except if they have first strike or double strike, in which case the creature with first strike or double strike will punch first, thus dealing damage first. And then after first strike damage is dealt, you check whether the other creature has died. If the other creature has died, it cannot punch back. So your creature will live, the other creature will die. So that makes sense? Yep, that makes sense. Okay. Okay. So then that is what I have done because I have used all my mana. I already played a mana this turn and I played a card out and he's out there hanging out. Um, sure. And that is my turn. So I will pass my turn to Alex. Okay. So I will go to my untap. So I'll untap my field miss border post. I don't have any upkeep triggers, so I will draw a card for my turn. I will play an island as my land for turn. And then I will tap my island and play a fairy seer. Ooh. Alex fairy is seer playing old cards. is a one blue mana fairy wizard with power and toughness 1-1. One, one. 
It has flying, which is another keyworded ability, much like first strike uh, or double strike that Tim mentioned. Um, flying means that it can only be blocked by other creatures that have flying or an ability called reach, um, which means you, they can reach up in the air and block the flyers. So uh, it is a, it's a one, one with flying and it has an enter the battlefield effect. When it enters the battlefield, scry two. And to scry, you look at however many uh, cards from the top of your library that it mentions. So scrying two, I look at the top two of my library. I'm going to keep them secret so Kathleen can't tell what they are. And I'm going to think about the cards that I have in my hand. And I'm going to decide if I want to put them back on the top or on the bottom of my library. So if I want to draw them or not, I will put one of them back on top and the other one on the bottom. So creatures normally can't attack the turn they enter the battlefield. They have what is called summoning sickness. Um, and most creatures can't, so most, most creatures can't attack the turn that they enter the battlefield. Some creatures have an ability called haste and haste is another keyworded ability that says they can attack uh, as soon as they enter the battlefield on the first combat phase that they're on the, on the board. But this one doesn't. Um, I will pass through my, my combat step because I can't attack. And I will do nothing on my second main phase. Mm -hmm. And I will pass my turn to Kathleen. Um, sorry. Um, Alex, you might want to refocus your camera because all yeah, I'm seeing is a blob. Yeah, very... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> oh, strange. It's very blurry. Okay. Let's see so here. then I am untapping my land. And I am drawing a card. Oh, and I am going to... There we go. That's a little better. Um... I am going to play another land, another white land, because I got all white. Um, and then I am going to... How much is your um, creature worth, Alex? It is a one power, one toughness. Hmm. Or did you mean mana yeah. cost of the no, creature? No, no, no. What the power and toughness? Yeah, sorry. Yes, no um, problem. Okay, it's a, so it's I'm a one one. Do all three, and I am going to put Edelon of Inspiration out. Okay. Um, and then I am going to attack. So I'm going to enter combat base. Yep, sure. and at the beginning of combat, on your turn, uh -huh. Eidolon of Inspiration says, target creature you control gets plus two, plus zero until end of turn. Right, so my Sunlit Hoplite is going to be my target creature, so that yep. will mean it is a 4-1, um, but if I do, but it also has first strike, so even if he, um, if he, like, defends, Blocks. this yep. will still kill his before he can hurt me, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. So I am going to do that. I'm going to attack and I'm going to, that's what tapping is called. Um, mm -hmm. With my sunlit hoplite, which is a 4 1. Mm. That's a lot of damage. It's fine. On it's turn all three. Fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> um, I will. Mm, I will not block. I will take. That four damage, and I will go to sixteen points of health. If you see up here in our cor in the corners of what we're doing, I don't know if you can see that, but if you see up in the top left of the screen where my cards are and where Alex's cards are, there's a life counter. Mine says twenty, and Alex's now says sixteen. That means yep. I'm winning. Team Kathleen. <laughs> All right. So you've gone through your combat. Do you have any effects on your second main phase? I do not. I am going to pass the turn. Okay. So on your end step, before it becomes my turn. Oh, God. I hate when you do this. I'm going to pay <laughs> one blue mana from my Fieldness border post, and I'm going to cast an instant. Oh. Brainstorm. Now, Brainstorm is a one blue mana instant that says draw three cards and then take two cards from my hand and put them on the top of my library in any order. So 
This is an instant. It does its effect, and it goes to the graveyard. So I will draw three. One. A two. A three. And then I will look at these cards and put them onto the top of my library. I just I want will... to point out that um, Alex's deck is not a beginner Planeswalker deck, although it is a pauper deck, which means all of the cards have been printed at least once at a common rarity. His yep, deck that's right. is probably significantly stronger than mine, so it's going to be hard for me to win. Yeah, I I very much doubt that. Greenstorm <laughs> is I... one of the most powerful blue commons, Alex. I know, <laughs> that's ridiculous. So Play what Alex is doing stuff. right now, if you want a bit more of advanced commentary, um, is card selection. It's what we call card selection. He gets to draw three cards, decide of all the cards in his hand, which two are the worst and put them back in the library. And not oh. necessarily the worst. It's, you know, when yeah. do I want to draw when them? Yeah, or that. Them? Yeah. So, yeah. obviously, like in a lot of other games, if you've played any kind of, any kind of card game, um, being able to get through your deck and get the cards you want is a very powerful thing in magic. However, yep. there's one very important thing. If you go through your entire deck and don't have a card to draw and it's your turn, you lose. So yep. that's called milling yourself out or milling your deck. And you don't want to do that. But that's why that card's really good because he was able to go through his deck, but he put them back on his library so he wasn't getting rid of cards in his library. Yep. So... Uh, that is the end of the effect, that so is. I will go to my turn. Yeah, there's I will... also something weird that, like, because, like, they said that you can play instants on anybody's turn, he basically said, wait, wait, I'm not going to let your turn be over yet, so I'm going to do all this stuff and spend this land that I have still open and stuff on your turn, so then when it becomes his turn, he gets all of it, he gets to untap all of his land and stuff again. That's a yep. kind of an advanced player move. Instants are instants are powerful. Tim, I also like that you're at a hundred life. That, that makes me yep. feel good. <laughs> I am untouchable. Uh, um, okay, so I have untapped. I don't have any upkeep effects, so I will draw my card for the turn. Um, on my first main phase, I will play a second island. Um. I will tap this one island to play another creature called Delver of Secrets. Uh. <laughs> so Delver of Secrets at the moment is just a 1-1. One, one. It says at the beginning of my upkeep, so we have a card that cares about an upkeep now. Yep. Um, you may look at the top card of your library. Oh, you, sorry, you look at the top card of your library, and then I may reveal that card, so I show it to all players. Yep. If the card that I reveal is an instant or sorcery, I will transform this card, and we'll worry about that later. And the important bit here is, guess who just got to decide what card is on top of his library? <laughs> so... <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> Okay, so Alex, okay. you were supposed to do things to teach people how to I'm teach I am teaching. <laughs> I'm, 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 very, I'm teaching beautifully. Okay, because, yeah. so, okay, so I'm going to go to combat. Um, I'm going to attack Kathleen for one damage, and this has flying. So unless she has some way to block a flyer, she's going to take the one damage. Yeah, I do not at this time have a way to block a flying damage, so I will have to take one. So now okay. I'm at 19, but I am still winning. You are. Uh -huh. um, then on my second main phase, I will tap a blue, and I will use my field mist border post to produce a white mana, so a blue and a white, and I will cast Journey to Nowhere. Uh-huh. So Journey to Nowhere is an enchantment. It says when it enters the battlefield, exile target creature. So exile is different from the graveyard in that exile is a zone outside of the game. Um, it can't Cards in exile normally can't be interacted with. Um, so things that send cards to exile are powerful. Um, but it also says when this 
permanent journey to nowhere, leaves the battlefield, you return the exiled card to the battlefield under its owner's control. So I am going to target one of Kathleen's creatures, and I think I will be targeting the um, the Eidolon of Inspiration with Journey to Nowhere. Oh, so until uh, Journey to Nowhere leaves the battlefield, Eidolon of, Inspiration for Eidolon of Inspiration is gone. Yeah, so I'm going to put him over here outside of the game. Yep. And that is the end of my turn. I have no more mana, and I have gone through my second main phase, and now it is Kathleen's turn. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I don't have any funky things like Alex did. Well, you were you don't have any mana open. Yeah, you know, yeah, if you so had mana open, you probably could have played something. Nope. Um, okay, so I'm drawing. Um, and... Unfortunately, I do not have any more um, any more mana, so I'm going to um, tap for two, and I'm going to put another sunlit hoplite out. Oh uh, no, not another one. Yeah, and I. Um, both of yours are one ones, right? I they are. Oh, one of them is ahead. tapped, and the other one is untapped. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and attack with my sunlit hoplite for two one with first strike. Sure. Um, I will once again take the damage. So I will take two more damage and fall to fourteen points of life. Okay, and then I'm going to pass because I do not have anything else I can do. Okay. Um, so Unless I will untap. maybe I do, and I have my one mana oh. that I haven't spent. I that'd be great. Oh. Emily, yes, you don't tell your opponent you can't do anything. <laughs> right, <laughs> <laughs> got to keep it a secret. Yep. All right, so I've untapped my creatures and my lands, and now we have an upkeep trigger to worry about. <laughs> so um, we're going to uh, this this upkeep ability uh, goes on the stack. I won't go into what the stack is, but it it happens. Um, so I look at the top card of my library, and I may reveal that card, and I will. It is Ponder. It is a sorcery. And because its condition has been met, that means that we transform Delver of Secrets. Now, transforming is a thing that some cards do, and some cards are double-sided. So that means not that this card turns... Not many cards are double-sided, but some of not, them are. Yeah, not many, but some are. Um, so this transforms and becomes Insectile Aberration, which is a 3-2 with flying. Oh, God. Please note that this doesn't um, give it summoning sickness again. Right. It, so because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the same yeah. uh, creature. It just yeah. has changed. It has never left the battlefield. It just flips over. Right. Yeah. Um, so then, after my upkeep happens, I draw the top card of my library, which we already know is a ponder. Another one of the more powerful blue commons in the game. Um, on my first main phase, I will play a planes. And... Then I will go to combat, and I will attack Kathleen with my new insectile aberration for three damage in the air. Uh-huh. And I have to take it, because I don't have anything flying yet. Okay. And that is all I will do. I will pass my turn. Hmm. Okay, so then I'm going to untap... And I'm going to draw a card. Mm -hmm. Untap um, the uh, Silent Hoplite as well. Yeah, make sure to always untap your creatures and lands oh, as well. Yeah. yeah. You have to untap everything. I forget about that sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get to untap, and you get to untap, and you get to untap. Everybody gets to untap! Uh -huh. I'm going to look um, through your deck list and see whether... So I may have a problem because I still don't have another land. Oh, no. I know. So, there are lots of very colorful words that magic players use when they don't get enough land to be able to play a card. <laughs> right. But I'm not going to are... teach all of you those yet. Um, but I am going to... 
Um, I'm going to just go ahead and I guess I'll attack with both of my sunlit hoplites first. I'm going to not play anything yet and I'm going to attack first. So I'm entering combat and I'm declaring these two and both of them have, oh, you have a 3-3 three, three now, but it's tapped. Ah. It's, um, a, okay. it's a 3-2, but yes, it is tapped. Yes. Okay, so I have a two, uh, two, two ones with first strike that I'm attacking you with. Okay. Um, before, after you oh, declare the attackers, you have all kinds of stuff. I'm going to tap three mana, oh. one white and two blue, and cast an enchantment with flash. Now, flash is another keyworded ability that means that this card can be played any time that you could play an instant. So it effectively turns whatever it is into an instant spell. But since this is an enchantment, it'll stay on the battlefield. But this is Omen of the Sun. Omen of the Sun is an enchantment with Flash that says when it enters the battlefield, make two one ones, uh, two one one white human soldier creature tokens, and I gain two life. So I'll just put this over here. When it enters the battlefield, I make two soldiers, one soldier, two soldiers. And I gain two life. So I will go back up to 16 from 14. And I will declare blockers. I will have each of these soldiers block one of your hoplites. But because your hoplites have first strike, my soldiers are going to die. But they did their job. So that so is the declaring... He his foot soldiers to my... Uh... Hoplites. Your hoplites. That's correct. So that was the declaring blockers. So you you declared attackers. I declared blockers after casting my spell. And then combat damage happens. Um, because Kathleen's creatures have first strike, they deal their combat damage first. And so my creatures both die, but I don't take any damage, which is nice. Hmm. Okay. So uh, then I am going to um, I guess pay two mana and play another sunlit hoplite. Oh, a third one. The <laughs> <A> power. <laughs> and then I'm going to pass my turn. Okay. I have I all will... these other very cool things in my hand to play if I could get more mana. I will untap. I will draw a card for turn. Hmm... I think it's I will. important to tell people too. If you um if you are brand new at this game, um a lot of these weird like keyword things like flash and flying and I mean flying's pretty self-explanatory, but right, right. first strike things like that, if you get <clears throat> if you get the arena starter kit, they will have explanations on the card of what the things are usually. Yep. And yep. also they're, um, well, they're not doing it next year, but usually each year they have a core set that comes out and usually decks from the core set. And I think we still have some of those in our store. Um, those will have like parentheses and explain what the keywords mean. Um, so mm -hmm. those are really good for beginning players. Okay, so um, what horrible thing are you going to do to me now, Alex? <laughs> um, I am going to pass through my first main phase and uh -huh. go directly to combat. Of uh, course um, you are. I would like to declare my insectile aberration as my attacker, and I will attack you for three flying damage. Okay, I really need to get something that flies. Or more mana, that would probably help. Too. Yeah, more mana would be good too, but yeah. Okay, um, and then on my second main phase, I will pay one blue mana and cast Ponder, a sorcery. Um, it says I can look at the top three cards of my library, put them back in any order. I may shuffle my library, and then I draw a card. So Why I will look at the want top. To put them back and then shuffle. So in case I look at them and I decide I don't really want any of these, I want to draw a completely different card. It could be one of these. It could be something completely different. But um, being able to get an extra look at what the top card might be um, gives you a little bit more of uh, deck uh, selection and drawing power. Um, 
So I'm looking at the top three cards in my library. I am going to... What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to put them back. Uh, I'm going to put all three of them back like that. And then I will draw a card. So you didn't shuffle your deck. I did not shuffle. Um, hmm. <laughs> I think that is all I will do. I will pass my turn and it will become Kathleen's turn. Really? Yes. Always be suspicious of a blue player with mana available to them. He does yes. mean, horrible things to me. He was supposed to let me win. I don't know. He he must not have gotten the memo. Um, you, I think I think you've got more creature. You've got more creatures than I do, and they're bigger too. Yeah, but I have no mana. Well, okay. I can't oh, do anything about that. And I still don't have any mana. Oh no! God. Okay. Usually, you would not tell people that you don't have any mana. Yeah, right. <laughs> you want to you want to create the illusion that you are ahead of your of, of right. Your but opponent. like, I just don't want to play more than three mana. It's fine. yeah, exactly. Um, things are okay. I don't. I'm just skipping my mana playing because mm -hmm. I am so sure I'm gonna win. That um, okay. So, I don't know, Tim, should I attack or should I not attack? He has all of his mana open. I've got yeah. three, three of my four mana. I do not okay. have all my mana what open. Do you... Well, given the current board state, you can't block any of his creatures anyway. Yeah. So, so you might as well, well just go on the aggressive. Okay. So yeah. I am going to go ahead and attack with all of my sunlit hop lights and let's see what he's saving that mana for. Yeah, um, you force I will, him to do whatever he's going to do. I will block one of them with my Fairy Seer, and I will take the other four damage. Yep. Really? Yep. Huh. So I will go from 16 down to 12. Wait. I get to okay. still do something, right? Yep. Sure. Yeah, this is okay. yeah the this is the so, the block has been declared. Let me go back up to going sixteen. To play a phalanx tactics. Sure. Which gives one of these a plus two plus one, and the other ones plus one plus one. So you'll block one, but that would be for seven damage instead. Okay. So seven instead of four. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Because one of them gets plus two, so that's four, and one of them gets plus one, which is three. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I will I will take seven. I'll go down to eleven. Woohoo! I did an instant. You did do an instant. I did. I'm yep. proud of you. Okay. I am really, really bad at playing instants. Well, you did it right that time. Did I? Yeah. Woohoo! Okay, and then um, and then that's all I'm going to do because I used my land. Okay. Um, before you end your turn, I'm going to activate the ability of Omen of the Sun here. So you might not be able to see it, but Omen of the Sun has an activated ability. And activated abilities are always written on the card as cost, and then a colon, and then the effect. Um, so I will pay three mana and sacrifice Omen of the Sun. Sacrifice means it goes to the graveyard. And then I will scry two as the effect. So I will tap my three mana. I will sacrifice Omen of the Sun. And I will scry two. As we all know, look at the top two cards in my library. Decide if I want them or not. Hmm. I think I do want them. I think I want, yeah, I want both of them. And I will just put them back as they were. Okay. Um, and then I will go to my untap. Untap everything, all these lands. Nice little lands that I got going on. A draw a card. Hmm. All right. I will, on my first main phase, tap a blue mana and play another Fairy Seer, which is another 1-1 one, one with flying. And when it's the battlefield, I get to scry two again. Um, this time, I don't like either of these, so I'm going to put them both onto the bottom of my library. And then I will go to combat. 
and attack Kathleen for three more flying damage. Oh. Well, now you're now I'm only very very narrowly winning. If uh, winning is looking at life totals, I'm uh-huh. only very 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 narrowly winning. Uh huh. Um. And then I will pass my turn. I will do nothing else. Okay. All right. I'm going to untap all of the stuff. <laughs> and I'm going to draw. Ooh! And I got a mana. Yay! Yay! Although it's not enough to play anything, really. Um... Yeah, I still, I have a lot Something of... Something else very... you don't want to tell you about it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. But... I'm not here, I can't hear you. Uh-huh. <laughs> I am, I think, because he still has tons of things out, I'm going to go ahead and attack for three with my sunlit hop lights. Or, I mean, attack with all three of those uh, okay. for my uh, combat phase. Sure. Um, I will declare blockers much as the same as last turn. I will block one of them and not block the other two. So now you get four. I do. Do you have any effects before damage takes place? No, not this time. Okay. I will take four damage down to seven. My fairy seer dies, goes to the graveyard. Okay. And then I am going to, um tap two, and I'm going to play Leonin of the Lost Pride. Um, when he dies, I get to exile a card from your graveyard, and he is a 3-1. Okay. Do you have any other cards that you'd like to play? Um, n- no, not at this time. I am okay. going to pass the turn. Sure. And hope on, you don't kill me this turn. On your end step, uh-huh. I'm going to uh, play another creature with Flash, a Spell Stutter Sprite. Um, it has an ability that counters a spell when it comes into play, but there are no spells uh, being cast, so it's just a 1-1 one, one with flying. Uh-huh. All right. Um, so I will... More advanced go. commentary here? Yeah, go for it. Uh Alex right now appears a little desperate because he's playing a spell status sprite without um, caring about his enter the battlefield ability. Um, so what he what he what we'd like to call telegraphing. What he's telegraphing is that he just needs a blocker. Yep. Yeah. I I do essentially need a blocker. I can't yeah. I can't keep he taking needs, two from each of those three creatures every turn because otherwise I will be dead in very short order. Yeah. Um, so you have him up against the ropes, is what I'm saying. That's yeah. good, because um, so I I've, can't so I've play untapped. any of my cards. <laughs> uh, no, no upkeep effects, so I will draw my cards for turn. Um, uh, now I feel very foolish for putting that land away. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, and okay, I didn't okay. read my cards. I've got a cool thing to do next time. Oh, all right. <laughs> Uh, huh. Huh, huh, huh. Okay. So, uh, first main phase, I'm going to tap the blue and play another ponder. Mm-hmm. Look at the top three. Um, uh, put them back like that. Uh, I'll draw a card. I will play... A land for turn. In this case, it's not a basic land. It's a Sejiri Step. It's a land that produces white mana. It enters the battlefield tapped. When it enters the battlefield, a target creature I control gains protection from a color of my choice until end of turn. Um, Protection meaning that the creature that is protected from a specific color or from a specific kind of thing... um, it can't be damaged, enchanted, blocked, or targeted by anything that it has protection from. Um, in this case, I will be giving my insectile aberration protection from white. 
um, because that's the only color that Kathleen has in her deck. Um, so there's no reason to give a protection for anything else. So until the end of my turn, uh, this insect elaboration has protection from white. Um, I will then go to combat. Yeah, I will go to combat. And I will attack for three air damage. Which I still can't protect. So I'm at seven. Hey, we're tied. Yep. Um, and then I will do nothing my second main phase. Will I do nothing my second main phase? Um, no, I will do something my second main phase. I'm changing my mind. I'm going to tap two mana and play a core sky fisher, which is a one and a white for a two three flyer. When it enters the battlefield, I return a permanent I control to my hand. So I will return this island to my hand. And then I will pass my turn. Huh, that's a lot of stuff out there. Okay. Yep. So I am going to do this. I'm untapping everything. Um, okay. Oops, I was trying to make my screen big so people could see what I was doing. Um... Let's see. Okay, so I have untapped everything. Mm -hmm. um, there. Now people can see. Then I'm going to draw a card. Sure. Um, and I am going to... I am going to go ahead and attack attack first with everything okay so that is uh well before you before you go to come naturally never mind i don't have mana for it okay uh how much damage is that total <laughs> um so it's the six with the um with first strike and then sure. three more so nine well, okay total so and nine, six, of, nine total and six of it has first strike Okay. I will be blocking. I will block the uh, the one with three power with okay. my spell, spell Stutter Sprite. Okay. And I will be blocking one of the two ones with my core Sky Fisher. Okay. So how many... Um, what is the power and toughness of those two cards? So the Spell Stutter Sprite that's blocking the three power oh, creature is just a 1-1. One, one. The core Sky Fisher is a 2-3. 2-3. Two, 2-3. Three. Two, three. So, so the two unless you have not going to die. No. It will be um, it will be blocking and killing one of your hoplites unless you have some kind of effect. Okay. So I am going to tap two mana and enchant that hoplite with a indomitable will which gives it a plus 1 plus 2. So that makes it a 3/3. Three, three. Yep. 3/3 with, three, three with first strike will certainly do it. Um Okay. I okay. will also I'll block. Leon Leonid dies. Uh, was it a three one? Yeah. Okay, sure. Yep. So and both of my creatures dies, die. You have to exile something from your graveyard. You get to this, choose. Know, this is what my graveyard looks yeah. like. Graveyard. Um, what should I exile? What's behind uh, Heliod's. Uh, Oh, so we got Brainstorm, Ponder, Fairy Seer, Omen okay. of the Sun, Fairy Seer, Ponder, Sky Fisher, Spell Stunner Sprite. I'd say Exile Brainstorm. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Brainstorm is exiled. Yeah. And then my enchantment stays Get that out on of here. this hoplite, right? <laughs> Yep. Yes, your enchantment stays on the hoplite. It's an aura. Auras are types of enchantments that enchant specific permanents. Um, and auras stick around on the battlefield, enchanted to the permanent that they are uh, attached to. Um, because enchantments are another type of permanent. Okay. And then, so that was combat. Yep. And then I'm in second main. Oh, uh, how much damage? I took t uh, four of that damage. Yep. Yeah, you're so I'm down to three. Okay. And then... I, this is the thing that I got wrong last time. 
I have a Daybreak Chimera. Okay. Um, which is five. It's supposed to be five mana, but and I didn't read it. It says this spell costs X less to cast, where X is devotion to your white. But I have four devotion to my white out there, so I, this only cost me one. I could have played Two. this a long time ago, and I didn't realize it because I didn't read the card. That's one of the big things. So I'm going to pay one mana to play a flying 3-3. Three, three. How about that, Alex? So um, I might be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it does cost actually two white. Two white? You can still cost it, but it costs two white. Because when it says this spell costs X less to cast, where X is your devotion to white, it reduces the generic cost, but not the color-specific cost. Oh. Yeah, because okay. you see so X is in a great circle. Though, so I'm still good. <laughs> yeah, yep. you're good. Yeah, you're fine. Yep. <laughs> Okay, and then I have a little nice chimera out there. You do. Yep. Your aberration so nice. is now blocked. <laughs> yep. I don't okay. have to take flying damage anymore. <laughs> Hooray! All right. Um, any other effects before I go to my turn? Nope, that is it. Okay. I will untap. I will draw a card. I will play an island. What are we doing? Um, okay. so Alex is now going to what we call the tank. Yeah, the, 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 ta the tank. The is tank is where you do all your thinking. Yeah. The, um, the very important thing that we have learned in this game is that you should read your cards and know your yes. cards are cards very do. important to read. <laughs> yes. Reading the card cards explains it. Before you play the game is probably important. Yeah. Right. Um, so in my first main phase, I will be paying two white mana and playing another Journey to Nowhere. <sighs> I will be exiling your Chimera. No! Oh, my poor Chimera. It was such a nice Chimera. It was a nice Chimera. Wait, wasn't and my he's, he... Eidolon supposed to come back? No, the if you didn't remove both Journey to Nowhere or the first Journey to Nowhere, it's still exiled under the Journey to Nowhere. Oh, you still have the first Journey to Nowhere? Oh yeah, you do. Yep. Huh. Okay. Um, and then I will, I will do nothing. I will pass my turn. I will not attack. I will go through my second main phase and will pass to Kathleen. Really? Really? He needs his uh, insect ab aberration to block. I do. <laughs> okay. Now. Um, okay. So then I guess I'll attack with everything. Uh, okay. Uh, hold up. Hold up. Hold up. <laughs> so as you're, as you're going to combat. Uh-huh. Before you declare attackers. Okay. I will tap three mana. Okay. Tap something and down. I will cast Pestermite. Yeah. Pestermite is a uh, uh, two-one flying fairy with flash, um, and it says when it enters the battlefield, I can tap or untap target permanent. So I will tap the hoplite that has the aura attached to it. Okay. So creatures that are tapped can't attack. So it's important that you play cards like this before your opponent declares attackers, because if you do it afterwards, the creature is already tapped and attacking, so it can't be tapped to prevent attack. Um, okay, so now now you can declare your attackers. Okay, so then I will declare both of these. What are okay. You, how, what, how big are your other things? Uh, uh, it's a 3-2 and a 2-1. Two, one. Three, both two. with flying. A three, two, and a two, one. Mm. And I have to block because I'm at three life. Right. Three, two, two, one. And they're both going to die because your hoplites both have first strike. So mine are going to kill yours. Correct. Without you doing three, anything two. to them, they're just going to die. Yeah, but I have a. They're both two ones, and you have a three. Right, but yours have first strike, oh, so yours will deal the damage to okay. mine, and so the three yeah, two will I'm die. I'm going to attack with both. 
Okay. Um, I could block with only one of them here and try to stave off some damage, but I, I'm at three and I really need to keep my life total above zero. So I'm going to block with both of my flying creatures. They'll both die, but I don't take any damage. Okay. And then I'm going to... I'm going to pass turn. Okay. Uh, I will untap. I will go to my upkeep. No effects. I will draw my card for turn. So what uh, looks like here is a board wipe. <laughs> uh, there are very few board wipes at common, I'll have you yeah. know. <laughs> yep. Um, I will tap a blue and play a very desperate second Delver of Secrets. <laughs> and I will pass my turn. <laughs> Okay, so then I'm going to draw, ooh, and I got a planes. Yay! Which means I have five planes. You do. You have a five means mana. I can spend all of those, and I can play Elspeth. Well, I have something to say about that. No, no, don't <laughs> say anything about it. I will pay one blue mana and I will cast Spell Pierce, which says counter target non creature spell unless its controller pays two mana. I don't have any mana. You do not. So Aww. I will. It When spells are countered, that means instead of coming to the battlefield or doing their effect, if they're non permanents, they just go straight to the graveyard. But I was going to get my Planeswalker on my last thing. Well, you're going to kill me anyway. I know, but I wanted her out. Finally, I got... I've had her in my hand since my I've very had this, first I've had this in my hand all game. Yeah, I had her in my hand since my very first hand. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. I'll be able to get my Planeswalker out. And then I had no mana. Um, no, okay. mana. So That's okay. Then I'm going to attack with all my sunlit hoplites. Um, so that's three, four, five, six, seven for a strike. I will block the one that's enchanted and I will still take four damage, going to negative one and life Kathleen total. Wins. And Kathleen wins the game. Yay! Some Good game. Beginners <laughs> can even win. Yep. Yeah. But usually Good game. it comes with help from like people like Tim helping me. Um, <laughs> so I think that was the a... very first game I ever played of Magic. I played against a level two judge. And, um, <laughs> I won just because a whole bunch of people were standing behind me telling me exactly what to do. But then I still had no idea what I was doing. It was horrible. But um, Yeah, playing by committee sometimes works, but to really understand the game, you have to do a, a fair amount of solo play so I you can like see you the interactions really for have yourself. To play a lot to understand it. Um, there's a lot of cards and it can be a very, very overwhelming game. But yes, it can you, be. Um, if you kind of have a deck and get to know that deck and play against mm -hmm. the same person a lot, you'll really get the rhythm of it. And then you can start exploring other colors and other things and then finally get into the deck construction mm -hmm. part of it, I think. One of the most important things to do as a Magic player is once you find a deck that you really like and you enjoy playing a lot of, play a lot of the deck. Um, because the more that you play the deck, the more you'll see the interactions between cards, the more you'll know what the likelihood is of drawing specific cards at specific times. Um, so being able to know what's in your deck and uh, you know what kind of things you're going to be able to draw into and what your game plan is, is very, very important. Um, almost more so than what your opponent is doing, is knowing... What, it, what your deck is doing because you can't you, know, you got to play your deck well to win so you need to know what your deck is doing first yeah, all about learning this deck um was a it had old cards in it but it was a red minotaur deck and mm -hmm. i mean it's not good enough to like beat a modern deck with planeswalkers and stuff in it but when we used to when david and i used to play 
and he had weaker decks before he actually started understanding how to build decks. It was so much fun because I loved the Minotaurs and it was great and I really mm -hmm. enjoyed that. Yeah. It's always fun to have a, a, a nice pet deck at home that you can pull out for nostalgia's sake or just for, for good practice. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're almost done. We need to be done in just a few minutes. I'm sorry that we got started late. Um, we did. But I want to talk a little bit about Zendikar Rising. Yeah. Um, oh, I also wanted to tell, the last thing that I wanted to tell anybody who's new who might watch this, one of my favorite ways to play and the way that I play most often is called a Sealed League. And Labyrinth um, runs Sealed League generally, um, usually in person before the end times. Um, we would do these in person, but now we're going to try and do it um, on this version here that's called Spell Table. So we'll have um, people chatting in Discord and then playing together on Spell Table like Alex and I just did. Um, I think it's going to start the Tuesday, one week after the release. So, yeah, I think so, it's the first Tuesday of October, I yeah. think is the, the week. But Sealed League is really fun. You buy three booster packs, so these things, um, which have 10 cards or 15 cards in them. And then you open three packs and you build a deck um, with whatever you want out of those three packs and any mana that you want. Um, but it's only a 30 card deck, so it's half of a normal deck. And so the games go really, really fast. Nobody's deck is super awesome because it's, you know, you're only opening kind of three random decks. And it's a really fun way to learn the cards in a new set. I enjoy it a lot. But we're going to do that the Tuesday night, the first week in October. Um, and then uh, we also have pre-release coming up next weekend. We're going to be doing an event Sunday night and one Tuesday night or Sunday afternoon-ish evening and Tuesday night. Um, to register for that, go to our events calendar. I'll put it in the chat. Um, but it's events.labyrinthgameshop.com and you'll see those there. You need to sign up. And basically, the cost of the event will include prizes and a pre-release kit and we're going to be playing over Spell Table 2. So mm -hmm. tell us what's happening in Zendikar. It sounds like, so it's going back to the plane of Zendikar. Tell me about Zendikar first. Sure. Um, so Zendikar originally, the first time we visited it, was uh, billed as an adventure world. Um, Zendikar is full of crumbling ruins and uh, massive landscapes and vistas um, that are ripe for exploring and treasure hunting. And so the first Zendikar set was very, very much focused on this theme of exploration. Um, lots of emphasis on treasure finding and traps and uh, running away from boulders falling after you, a la Indiana Jones, things like that. Um, the second time we went to Zendikar was uh, a couple of years ago, and the plane of Zendikar was being decimated by these giant uh, monstrosities called the Eldrazi from beyond the blind eternities, which is a, a big lore thing we won't get into, but there were giant spaghetti monsters destroying the plane. Um, and the whole deal with that set was trying to get rid of them. Now we're finally back to Zendikar and things have seemed to have calmed down slightly. So there are no Eldrazi in this set. There are no giant space tentacle monsters. Um, it's more focusing on uh, the adventure themes um, and the land, uh, the connect, the the tension between uh, like artifice and between lands. So that's reflected in, in both the art and the style of the set, but also in the mechanics of the set as well. Okay, um, so one of what do you think we're going to see? I know there's well, there's a new thing called set boosters, but what yep. about let's talk mechanics first before we talk about products. So what sure. are the new kind of new things that are coming in this Zendikar set? Um, Tim, I'll talk about returning mechanics and then you want to do the new mechanic. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, so the returning mechanics that we have seen before, um, which not everybody might be familiar with. Um, the biggest one is called landfall. Landfall is a way to shorthand 
um, a activated ability or a, a triggered ability um, that cares about lands entering the battlefield. So there might be a creature with landfall that you have that says, whenever a land enters the battlefield under you control, this creature gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. Um, so landfall is a very popular mechanic um, because t being able to turn your lands, which is essentially your, your mana, um, into additional resources and additional power for your side of the board is very, very good um, because you get extra value out of things that normally would have just made you mana previously. So landfall is one of the big returning mechanics. Um, another returning mechanic is called kicker. And kicker means that in addition to the normal casting cost of a spell, you can pay some an additional amount of mana to get an additional effect. So this uh, a card called Into the Royal is being printed in, uh, in Zendikar Rising that says, return uh, a creature to its owner's hand. If this spell was kicked, you pay two more mana for it, and you get to draw a card in addition to returning something to its owner's hand. So you get to, if you get to uh, play it early, it might have a smaller effect. If you play it late, it has a larger effect. Um, so it gives you uh, benefits for playing spells both early and late in the game. So it feels like you're using your mana more efficiently. I feel like there was another set relatively recently that had kicking in it. Did it? I think Dominaria. You're right. Dominaria. Dominaria. That's right. That's right. I because re I remember that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Kicker is another very popular uh, returning mechanic. A lot of mechanics in Magic the Gathering actually are just variations on Kicker. Huh. Okay. So what yeah. else? So then we come to the new mechanics, um, which include, first of all, um, you saw Alex play a few uh, Dova Secrets double-faced cards. Mm -hmm. uh, double-faced cards will also be making an appearance in Zendikar Rising, but as a different sort of double-faced cards. Um, so in Zendikar Rising, their version of double face cards uh, basically has one face has a spell on it. Um, could be a creature, an instant, a sorcery, I think. All three mm -hmm. are included, or enchantments. Um, and the other face on the other side, it doesn't transform, but what it does is this modal double face card when you play it from your hand, you get to decide whether you want to play it as the spell, and you pay the cost, and you cast the spell, and you do everything as you usually would do. Or the other side of the card is a land card. So you decide whether you want to play it as a spell or a land. And once it's out there, it remains whatever you played it as. Yep. So and this you is can't useful. you ever flip it on the board? Nope. nope. Huh. Yeah. Once you once you put it down, if you played it as a land, it's a land forever. If you played it as a creature, if the other side happens to be a land, if you played it as a creature, it's a creature forever. Yeah. That's interesting. So it's to help you have more choice. So let's say you draw a card you can't cast, like Kathleen was stuck on like three lands forever and you wouldn't be able to cast anything that cost more than that. So you can choose instead, instead of casting the spell you or like having the spell you can't cast in your hand, you can put it down as a land card and have it function as a land instead. So it's just greater choice, greater player choice. That's cool. That sounds neat. Yep. Um, and then the other mechanic is especially fun for anyone who's ever played Dungeons and Dragons. So what the mechanic is called party. And what you're trying to do is that some creatures and some spells will care about um, how many members are in your dungeon uh, party. For example, you want to assemble a party of up to one each of a cleric, a rogue, a warrior, and a wizard. So if you remember the creatures, they all had creature types. Um, in this set, they care about what kind of creatures you're playing. So if you are able to assemble a, a full party, you get the maximum benefit from whatever you play that cares about your party. Right. Yeah. So there are some uh, cards that 
say, you know, this creature's power is equal to the number of creatures in your party. And that can probably be anywhere from like one to four. And there are some other cards that say, if you have a full party, which means that you have one of each of those creature types, you get an additional effect or a, a more powerful version of the effect. Yeah. Hmm. That sounds really complicated. No, it's a, it's a little complicated. Yeah. Um, but I feel like every creature in the set has one of those four um, creature types. Creature types. Yeah. So it's probably going to be pretty easy to find whatever kind of creature that you need. Um, especially if you're trying to play a, a lot of party related cards. Um, it might that all those creatures might not be like the best creatures, but they'll probably be worth it to get the creature types you need to make your party cards happen. Hmm. Okay, well that sounds like fun. Um, yeah, that should be interesting. I think it's definitely that, interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, Zendikar Rising is on our store, on our online store now for um, pre-order, um, yep. as well as the pre-releases are um, listed on our event calendar. And we hope that you can join us for Magic sometime, and hopefully sometime soon we'll be able to have events in the store again. Um, we have hired a new Magic employee who is going to be in the store sometimes. So um, if you need to stop by and have us help you pick out a new deck or anything, we're happy to do that. And yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining us today. And if you are not watching this live and it's a recording, thank you very much for coming. We had some technical difficulties, so we had to change up how we were videoing this. And um, But we really enjoyed it. And hopefully we can do it again as soon as we figure out why zoom won't um won't stream to twitch well we'll we'll get our, we'll get our stuff sorted for the next round yeah, of this sometime i don't know technology is still at a loss to me but um yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> i feel the so same lot, alex for joining me and i think yeah, absolutely disappeared i don't know where tim went but um, uh, yeah oh, thanks yeah, here tim is still there okay tim thank you very much for helping me beat alex that's always fun. you're welcome anytime <laughs> <laughs> Um, I love it when I win magic. I don't like it so much when I lose, but I do like it when I win. Well, I'm glad I could help you do the thing you like, Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's fun. I really, I enjoy playing magic with my son a lot. He really loves it. And it's a fast, fun game that we can play at home um, when we don't have a lot of time. It's also really great um, to be able to just take a deck with you if you're traveling or if you're, you know, going somewhere and want something to do quickly. It's, uh, it's most, nice for that. Most decks will fit.